Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 58, Glory and the Shortest Proof. I'm your host, Mark Kane. It's question answering day, and this comes from one of my own neighbors. How cool is that? Also, we'll hear from a New Zealander at the end. Today, it's John 17, 5. This is one of the more difficult verses for me. Here. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. If you're new, that passage would be difficult for me because I am a Unitarian Christian. In fact, this podcast is for Unitarian Christians. If that's not you, please stay and make my acquaintance. And so that you know, Unitarian Christians are distinguished from Trinitarian Christians by their understanding of the person of God and His Son. We believe the only true God, the Almighty, is the one Jesus referred to as His Father. Yahweh, the Almighty Creator of the universe, is a person and referred to, quite naturally, with a singular pronoun, He. We don't believe He is a they. Now, you may be pre-convinced that by not believing the Trinity is the correct theory, we are doomed and dangerous. I would suggest this is something you were taught, not something you read in Scripture. If you're looking for a fun challenge, maybe something to dig into during next month's Bible studies, see if this is true. In the Scriptures, is being Trinitarian foundational to being Christian? And as a help, I mean, If you have plans to interact more with folks like us, it's a good start by noticing our common ground. We Unitarian Christians, not Unitarian Universalists, we do respect Scripture greatly. In fact, it was when we saw what Scriptures taught, or didn't teach, about the Trinity that we had to make a seriously hard decision. Stay in good standing with our friends, family, church, or follow our conscience on what we saw in Scripture. I would hope that this resonates with you and that you can agree with us on this premise. Scripture is a higher authority than church or tradition. So if you find one of us who shares this foundational belief with you, I think you could have very fruitful and interesting conversations. That's actually the case with my question today. I often think about the process of interpretation, not just what is the interpretation. Hermeneutics, that's what it's called, the methodology of interpretation. How is it we conclude what a passage teaches? What about our prior influences and our motivations? Do we come to a passage already convinced of something and then look and find it in there? (laughs) Well, yes, we do, all the time especially when we are looking at specific and contentious doctrines. Maybe if we are just reading and asking God to teach us, we might just roll with the text. But if we are thinking about a specific doctrine, and worse, if we are considering someone who disagrees with us, we shift into a find-the-doctrine mode, kind of like a Where's Waldo theology game. I'm not pointing a finger here. I do this too. When a passage I read sounds like something I believe, I latch onto that detail and make a note of how well it's demonstrating my correctness. It's very affirming. (laughs) You know, Scripture, if read and understood the right way, it's quite (laughs) doctrine-affirming. I'd even suggest a lot of the Bible teaching that takes place could be described as doctrine affirmation therapy. The more challenging and questionable a doctrine is, the more the teacher must assuage the concerns of the struggling student, like a soothing balm. Today we will review the key passages which demonstrate our sound and unassailable doctrine and thereby conclude that our doctrine is the only true teaching and that others are certainly wrong. This process often relies upon the affirming warmth of compatible passages, those which perhaps don't actually describe the teaching, but which don't contradict it either. They fit in with it. They are compatible with it, to enough of a degree that mm, it's close enough. Clearly, this passage demonstrates the truth of our teaching today. Here, let me show you another. 
it's a pervasive problem. Scripture is large, steeped in historical context, which is thousands of years removed from us, and it has to be translated into our language by humans. There are many things which, in isolation, would be confusing or even misleading. That's why we are to apply care, patience, and prayer in our studies. It's why knowing about bias is a helpful thing. Our bias prevents us from looking sincerely at alternatives. It sometimes filters out details of a passage which don't exactly sound like our theory, only to grab hold tightly to the portion of the passage that does. I wish there was a simple solution to this, but knowing how easily we do it, how bias can interfere, it's the first step in our recovery program. Let's just all agree to pause at the ledge before we leap to conclusions. Today, class, we learned the Pythagorean Theorem. When finding proper evidence for a given doctrine, there are cases when there are few, if any, clear passages which outright and unambiguously state the doctrine. So, the Pythagorean Theorem. The shortest proof between two passages is a straight supposition. For example, Psalm 107, Yahweh calms the storm. Mark 4, Jesus calms a storm. Jesus is Yahweh. Or Luke 5.21, who can forgive sins but God alone? And Matthew 9.2, Jesus declares forgiveness to the paralytic. Jesus is God. See how this works? Professor Wright, that's fascinating. Yes, Colton. Here, Isaiah 43, 11. I am Yahweh, and besides me there is no Savior. 1 John 4, 14. The Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Jesus is Yahweh. I talk about this one in episode 28, the none besides God rule. God shares his glory with no one, Isaiah 42, 8. Jesus is glorified with God's glory, John 17, 5. Therefore... Oh, oh, I have a good example of this. And it's the topic today. I had a brief exchange online. It was in a Christian apologetics Facebook group. Someone posted something about the Trinity, and this was one of the intriguing comments. Kerry wrote... I have a full two-year study on this subject of the Trinity. It would take a lot of room to post the many verses and study given on it. Yet, my favorite verse to prove Jesus is also God is this one, John 17, 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. God shares his glory with no one. This verse speaks loudly about Jesus also being God. So, recognizing the Pythagorean theorem at work, I commented in reply. Carrie, do you understand John 17, 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, to be a different glory than the glory described in 17, 5? To which Carrie replied, Mark, that is a tough question that requires further study. In no way does it discount that Jesus is also God and that John 17, 5 clearly states that. Uh, Professor Wright? Yes, Colton? It does seem that if you consider the latter verses in the chapter about glory... Uh, the theorem requires a straight, not meandering line, Colton. Oh, oh yes, I understand. I wasn't finished. Proceed. So, if Jesus gives glory to his disciples in 1722... And God shares his glory with no one, Isaiah 42, 8. That would mean, then, the straightest supposition is, Jesus is not God. See? Nonsense. Your comprehension of the theorem is admirable, but your application is severely wanting. You should not make ridiculous claims that we all know are false. <laughs> okay, so... Actually, there are likely some good points to be made with this approach, this theorem. 
And please know that I made up the name. But it is easy to make many points with it. It's like Bible Connect the Dots. And with 66 books to pull from, one can find a lot of combinations, many of which are not sound and may have you looking silly when someone challenges it. Always prefer direct and explicit texts. When you have to go into the laboratory and use two different verses which each say something different and then combine them in a test tube, maybe heat them up a bit with some emphatic gestures and confident affirmations, only to then form a doctrinal compound which is proof of something? Well, well, just be careful. Those straight-line suppositions between two verses can be so tempting to use. But under scrutiny can be flawed. A rush to a proof. An eager grasp at evidence to support a theory. Be wary of teachings which lean on this theorem. In Carey's case, he saw Jesus being glorified as evidence that he had to be God because God doesn't share glory. Then in the same prayer, Jesus prays that the glory given to him would be given to all his disciples. If humans, who are not God, can be glorified with the glory that Jesus had and that glory is proof that Jesus is God, then either we are also God or this talk of glory needs a bit more of a meandering line review. <laughs> Interesting that after two years of study, this particularly weak proof somehow rose to the top of his favorite list. What does this imply? Well, several things, I'm sure, but it does show the overwhelmingly alluring attraction of the Pythagorean theorem. The Trinity doctrine has been taught by Christians for hundreds of years. It states that God is one being or essence, and he's three persons, or they're three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's generated a lot of disagreement over the years and many, many books of theories on how it works or how it might work, and they're still writing them. Depending on who you talk to, the Trinity is vitally critical, or it's important but not something you think about too much, or it may be absent entirely. It's a theory that people use to describe God. It's based on a mix of logic, scriptural inferences, and speculation. I mean, to say that Jesus and God share in the same divine essence, which is one of the things Trinitarians might say, is speculation. Where is that essence described in Scripture? Where is it shared? It's not. It's a theory. As such, it's not a salvational requirement. And in fact, it's not even a point of biblical contention. There are no debates, no struggling or arguing with the strictly monotheistic Jews. A tripersonal God just wasn't on their mind. So I think there's more to this topic than just arguing about verses. This means this. No, it means that. No, this. No, that. It's easy to descend into a back-and-forth argument. I think there's a better way. We have neighborhood friends, a family that we've known for 21 years. Our kids grew up with their kids. We visit often and enjoy each other's company. Sometimes we pull out guitars and sing together. They're Presbyterians, and they have been taught and believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, naturally. That could be a serious wedge between us, but patience, love, some discussions, We've come to a place where they recognize that our faith in God isn't strictly tied to this doctrine. They recognize that we do seek God and His will in our lives. We treat Scripture with respect. We walk humbly. And we love truth. We have a lot in common. I think they sort of understand what I just explained. The doctrine of the Trinity and its implications and nuances and difficulties, these things do not occupy space in Scripture. And they certainly aren't presented as, here's how you know a Christian, you will know him by his confession of the three in one. These neighbors have afforded us a lovely measure of grace on this issue. So Anne, the mother, she wrote me several weeks ago. 
I haven't had a chance to follow up yet with her, so why not make it a podcast, right? She wrote, Good morning, Mark. I sometimes run across Jesus equals God Bible verses, and I think, how can Mark rationalize this? These verses come up pretty often. But I think we can have this dialogue because we are good friends. This one today just seemed like there is no way around it. Jesus said this shortly before his death in the high priestly prayer. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. John 17, 5. Just some theological food to chew on. Anne. First, I want to use this as an example of a great way to engage in what could be controversial topics. Notice when she asked, how can Mark rationalize this? She was describing what she was thinking. It isn't a condemnation. It's an honest expression of what she thinks about. And to clarify, she could have said, Mark, how can you not see this? She was able to say that she disagrees with me, but not directly accuse me of error. I think that's a perfect way to introduce a topic, provided you are intending to maintain a friendship. And second, she invites me to dialogue. She does so with a genuine curiosity and a friendly spirit. She does so with respect. She's recognizing our common ground, though she didn't say it in the note. We both love truth, read scripture, and desire to follow God based on what we find there. That's significant. If you have people in your life who share that same basis of Scripture and truth, you can approach these topics the same way. You are on the same page. You may disagree on some key things, but we should not confuse a disagreement with a willful rejection of truth or of God. (laughs) There is such a thing as not having attained to a full understanding. One of us, Anne or myself, is closer to the truth and one is further from it. But that's how it is with everyone. So we can lighten up a bit. We can be mistaken, and it's okay to admit it. Anne, thanks for this exemplary note, and here's my response. Some of us may be very familiar with proof texting. You know, dropping verses on the other person that prove them wrong. I don't like that approach. Scripture wasn't written for us so we could take a few sentences and trumpet them as evidence that others are wrong. Scripture was written so that the reader would go through the books and understand God's involvement in our world and our role in it. It's written so that we can see beyond ourselves and turn to God. Proof texting against your opponent usually comes across as, look, I'm right, and you're wrong, and Scripture, like, This verse here, and this one here, and and this one here, it confirms it. The Bible and I, we're on the same page. And you, you aren't. If the plethora of Christian denominations in the world demonstrate something, it's this. People can find things in Scripture that may not really be there. If you have a particular view on something, the Bible is big enough and varied enough that you can find a passage that seems to say, or at least kind of fits with, what you believe. I mean, within reason, of course. Uh, If you think Jesus is a giant turtle that plays guitar, then no, you won't be able to find a verse that hints at that. Oh, idea. Proof texting tempts us into zeroing in on a particular verse, or even a phrase, and drawing conclusions that we confidently overemphasize. I believe this is a short-sighted way to interact with Scripture. Throwing a text at someone to show they are clearly wrong, well, it's much more likely to shut down what could be a great conversation. Worse, it might generate anger and defensiveness rather than invite a great discussion. Note, Anne was not throwing that verse at me like a proof text. She used it to introduce a discussion. So, I think John 17, 5 isn't a clear indicator that Jesus is God, but I'm very willing to say it is one of the more difficult verses from my perspective. So I'm not going to offer a specific view and declare it to be the obvious and clear solution to this. Instead, I want to explore the possible ways one can read this. I want to create 
a menu of sorts, of possibilities. I'm not going to insist my view is correct. I don't need to. Because I believe truth is truth, and it doesn't need my help. My job is to look for it, consider it, and let God's Spirit do what it needs to do in me and in those I'm talking with. For the Trinitarian, John 17.5 puts Jesus there, in heaven, sharing this glory with another person of the Godhead, God the Father. And that is a possibility. This passage is compatible with a Trinitarian view. But it's also compatible with other views. Within the first few centuries of Christianity, there were many, many who believed Jesus was a second divine being created as the first of God's efforts. They believed the Logos was a kind of demiurge. This is a view sometimes called Arian. It's not important why it's called that. These early Christians looked at the book of John to support their beliefs, and they found a lot there. This passage, in fact, seems to say exactly what they believe. You have the Father, who is naturally God himself, sharing something with this other one, Jesus, way back before creation. Yeah, exactly. Is this not proof that God's first creation was the person of the Word, the Logos, the Son, and He shared His glory with the Son back before time? Yeah, that's kind of what this looks like. So is John 17, 5 a proof for their Arian view? No, not really. It's just compatible with their view. Quite nicely compatible, yes, but it's not quite a proof. You'll notice it doesn't describe the origin of Jesus. Was he, as the Trinitarians say, co-equal and co-eternal with God? Hmm, well, no, that's not clear. Or was he of the same divine essence? No, that's not in this passage at all. Or was he the first of God's creations, like the subordinationist Logos theorists believed, or the Arians? Well, it doesn't even describe his origin. It just seems to put him there, sharing glory. And what does sharing glory mean? Is it God bestowing glory on his subordinate Logos? Or does it mean he's God himself, or of the same essence as God? Well, as Carlton touched upon earlier, Jesus shares that same glory with us in the same chapter, John 17, 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. So it's quite plausible that the glory he shared has nothing to do with being God or of his essence at all. I mean, he shares it with us. So, who is this father Jesus was praying to? Was he talking to another person within the triune Godhead? Or maybe Jesus was referring to God himself, like Yahweh. The term father in the book of John, especially when Jesus talks about him, is God. He's Jesus' God and he's our God. And that's by Jesus' own words in John 20, 17. Nothing here indicates how father is to be understood much less that the Father is one of three persons of God. So, it's a safe bet that John's original audience would equate Father with Almighty God. Thus, a reasonable reading is that Jesus was with God. Jesus was with Yahweh. And maybe this is obvious to some of you, but being with God has a different meaning than being equal to God. From a Trinitarian perspective, I think what we glean from this passage is that Jesus was there in person before creation. And that's about it. That's not proof of the Trinity, nor a proof that Jesus just is God himself. This passage is simply compatible with the Trinity theory, just as it is compatible with at least one non-Trinitarian theory. There's just a lot missing here that would be needed to draw specific doctrinal conclusions. And we are at a disadvantage. This language of sharing glory before creation, it doesn't pop up much. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they entirely bypass Jesus' pre-birth activity. If they knew of it, they didn't find it worth including. So we don't have lots of correlating passages like this where together we can piece out all the details. 
John 17, 5 kind of stands alone. I would say, between the two ideas I've already presented, I think this verse fits more with an Arian view of a second lesser being. But there is yet a third way to view it. There is a way of describing things that was common to the Jews at the time. (laughs) It's a way which is not common to us. We don't really talk this way today. Well, here, if I'm convinced that my marriage with Karen was a part of God's ultimate plan for the universe, then I could say the following. My marriage was foreknown before creation and made manifest in the late 20th century. Our marriage was according to the foreknowledge of God. Our wedding happened according to the definite plan of God. Our matrimony was promised before the ages began. Our love was present with God before time. Our union was already prepared by God before we existed. We were married before the foundation of the world. All of this sounds a bit odd to us, but it isn't odd to the people in Scripture. The authors used this language, and I've put a list of them in the show notes. They spoke of the certainty of God's plans and tied that certainty right back to before time. It's what is called notional preexistence. When something is certain, it can be described as being with God, set in His plan and mind, established as though real, but before time began. Then, that thing later becomes real at some point in time. We don't talk like that now, of course. I don't get a new car and say that it was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but made manifest last Thursday at the dealership. Maybe we don't talk like this, but if you search the New Testament, it's how they would describe certain aspects of God's big plan. Let's look at John 17, 5 that way. We see Jesus talking about a glory as though he really had it, but he's technically asking for it now. There are two time points, before creation and now. This is the pattern of notional preexistence. Something was foreknown with absolute certainty, but that something didn't really come to pass until later. Jesus could have been talking in that same way, describing something from God's ultimate plan as though it was in existence back before it technically came into existence. Now, some of you may believe this is a preposterous grasping at whatever I can, to try to be right. Well, maybe. But you'll note that in the face of a difficult passage, I didn't just make up a solution, such as eternal generation or the dual natures of Christ. Instead, I found ideas that already existed in Scripture and applied them here. This is, I believe, an entirely legitimate and third way to interpret this passage. I feel pretty confident in this because this isn't the only place in the New Testament where this notional preexistence model is used in reference to Jesus. There are several of these, but my favorite is this, 1 Peter 1.20. He, Jesus, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. You see, it's the two-part model. Something was before the world, and it was made real later. 1 Peter 1.20 could legitimately be saying essentially the same thing as John 17.5, only in more detail. And just as a bonus bit of thought, notice that Peter, in describing Jesus, opted to use the notional preexistence model. He could have said many things about Jesus, and if he was a Trinitarian, he'd have a lot of options to draw from. I mean, I hear these phrases often today because I listen to Trinitarian teachers. If asked, the two significant points in question here would be one, Jesus' eternal existence as God, and two, his incarnation as a human at a point in time. But Peter did not say any of that. When looking back to the beginning of time and thinking about Jesus, He didn't say Jesus was actually there. 
he didn't write, he, Jesus, was with God the Father before the foundation of the world, but came to earth as a baby in these last times for the sake of you. No. Peter says he was foreknown. Now, ask any Trinitarian you know, hey, tell me about Jesus before time began. You know what they won't say? Oh, yeah, he was foreknown. That's not how you talk about an eternal Savior who was actually there. Foreknown, well, that's how you talk about God's plan and his intention for a Messiah, a plan that was established and would not be thwarted. So now we have three ways of interpreting the passage. I don't think the text makes any of these three obvious or clear. It doesn't have a lot of detail and leaves much to the reader. Thus, we have to weigh the possibilities and look at the larger picture. (laughs) And that's the fun part, if you ask me, even if it is more involved. We like quick answers. We like feeling right. We like the shortest proofs between two passages, the straight suppositions. We even like it when someone else tells us what a passage means, and, and we just trust them. That's a load off our shoulders. See the ending of episode 53, The Chiff of Life. Our beliefs should not have foundations built from possible implications of selected passages. They shouldn't come from proof texting. They shouldn't depend on the Pythagorean theorem. Our beliefs have to come from entire books, from the full narratives of Scripture, from what the authors explicitly and repeatedly teach, and with a mindful eye on what they did not teach. So I do take John 17.5 in this third way. I think it fits well with many of the very explicit verses about Jesus and his God. I think it fits with a Jewish way of talking about things that were not as though they were. I think it makes sense because I don't see the authors trying to explain how somehow God could die, along with all the other difficult implications of the Trinity. I choose the notional preexistence explanation because it fits best as I see it, not because it's the obvious way to read the passage. It's just a difficult passage, and it's the best I've been able to do with it so far. For some of you, this idea of notional preexistence, of something being talked about like it is already real and certain, even though it hasn't happened yet, this may still seem a bit strange. So I've got an example based on language, right here in John 17. It's in Jesus' prayer, verse 20. I do not ask for these only, the disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Notice that he says he has given that glory. He didn't say he will give it to us someday. And yes, he is talking about us, even though we are 2,000 years later. See verse 20, he's praying for all who will believe. And what does he say about us? I have given the glory to them. Well, he did not technically give me glory 2,000 years ago during this prayer. I wasn't there. So what did he do? He prayed this, with certainty based in the foreknowledge of God from the dawn of time itself. Jesus knew what God had in mind, and it was for us. God had intended from the very start for people to live and rule on earth in communion with him, according to his ways. And he intended that these people would share in this same glory that he shared with Jesus. And there, in that prayer, Jesus spoke of our glorification as though it had already happened. I have given the glory to them. Therefore, it would be accurate for me to pray the following. Jesus, 
glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you 2,000 years ago in Israel. Anne, I appreciate your question and how you asked it. I hope my response was in the same spirit. It's common for folks to reply with, this is the correct interpretation. Instead, I sought to answer it by thoughtfully pondering the possibilities. I trust that this is adequate to take and prayerfully ponder. And your question also gives me an opportunity to toss in an appendix, some follow-up takeaways, bonus content of sorts. Call them tips for talking about doctrinal disagreements, and and they are based in your fine example. First, trust. If the person you are talking with also seeks God's will and His truth, trust that they will take your input and work through it, them and God. You don't have to be the source of all the answers, and it isn't your responsibility to convince people. Just share and trust. Second, offer options. It's comforting to make everything black and white. This interpretation is obvious and clear. That interpretation is lousy and biased. Why not just lay them out honestly and let the truth speak for itself? Interpretive options are okay. The Bible is sometimes hard to understand. It's written thousands of years ago in different languages. Just allow for that and relax a bit. Think through possibilities. Offer options. Third, ask bigger questions. It's easy when proof texting is the go-to method for arguing to get really dug in and caught up in minutia, the little details of a passage but that approach could easily miss the forest for the trees. So ask big questions. Think about the broad implications of each possible interpretation. Questions are good, and big questions remind us that Scripture is a big-picture book. It's not a collection of small passages you can load into your I am correct gun and shoot at people. Fourth, discuss topics with love and patience. Anne's question was an excellent example of how to engage with others. Share your honest thoughts without wagging a finger at their error. When you appreciate the other person, when you can consider their background, their upbringing, you can apply grace to the discussion and treat it as an opportunity to discover and grow for both of you. Fifth and finally, enjoy your discussion. This is pretty simple, but it can be hard because we feel it's our obligation to accurately defend every doctrine we believe with clarity and resolve. That's a lot of pressure. Scary pressure. The truth is, we're always learning. And deep down, we know we are probably wrong on some things. Be humble and take a load off your shoulders. Do check out our list of upcoming events, unitarianchristianalliance.org forward slash events. I had the joy of attending Fuel in Indiana last week, and it was fantastic. I last attended as a student around 30 years ago. It's amazing this event has continued year after year, and it was so encouraging. I met many young people that week, and it gives me hope to see their passion for God. I'm working to have you all meet a few of them in the coming weeks. I also had the joy of dropping in on an isolated Unitarian Christian on my way home. We spent a few hours sharing our lives, reflecting, discussing our hopes, and praying for each other. As if an encouraging week couldn't get better, well, it did. Another event update, registration is open for the Kingdom Fest in New York, coming up in September. Check out the details on the events page. Also on the list of upcoming events is the UCA Conference, October 13th through 15th. In the next episode, I intend to have a discussion with Stacy Berger, who we've met before in episode 36 after the first conference. I want to talk more about what is planned, about the addition of the workshops and the informal meetups where you can find others with common passions. I'm pumped. Watch for a video showing the venue and another describing the UCA pre-party. Oh yeah, no joke. If you belong to a group, a ministry, or whatever, and you often have to meet together Our venue at the Lawrenceville Church of God in Springfield, Ohio, is open all day on Thursday, October 13th, before the conference starts that night. If you have a lot of your team already coming, 
Just plan your next business meeting for Thursday morning or afternoon. Let us know you want a space and show up and get your business done and then enjoy the rest of the weekend. The conference ends Saturday, and for those who stay through to the next morning, there will be a list of Unitarian Christian churches in the area that you can visit. Yes, there are several there. Registration is open now. Same prices as last year, so take that inflation. Write to me, podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org, or attach an audio clip of your thoughts, or click the record link in the show notes. Also, a reminder that I've been putting indexes in the show notes so that you can jump to different parts of the episode. Note that not all podcast players recognize those, but they are there. Hello, Mark. Ken Osborne from Timaru, the island of Tihuai Punamu in Aotearoa. In other words, the South Island, New Zealand, mate. When it comes to um, communicating, I can do various things here. If we want to... um, Hang on a minute. (laughs) I was going to be smart. And say we can even do it in Morse code, but it's bad radio communications today. Here we go. Even... Morse code we can communicate by <clears throat> if I lose my voice completely. Um, my locals here, you know, drive me bananas I try and reach them with some of these things, but I want to tell people about where I'm at and what do you think of this, and, um, and things go quiet, you know. So anyway, <laughs> this is what I sound like. I sounded uh, more like that in the last few days because um, having um, no voice due to this COVID nonsense, which is pretty much over now so yeah g'day from new zealand i'll put this onto the computer and send it as a wave file if it's not too big see ya and that is precisely what he did ken thanks for sending that along it's great to hear your voice who knows if we'll ever meet in person at least on this side of the resurrection but it's been a joy following along with your comments on the youtube channel for this podcast i really appreciate hearing from you If you know others who have been asked the same question as Anne asked me, perhaps the approach I took here is to your liking. If so, share it. Note, of course, that if you share it with a Trinitarian, they may not be sure what you're up to, given the purpose of this podcast and all. So you may have to prep them a bit. Anne, thank you for the good question. Maybe you didn't expect my answer to come in the form of a podcast episode, but how many times can you say you ask someone a theological question and they answered with a podcast. (laughs) Some hints on episodes in the works. An ex-Mormon, some encouraging youth, and a tale of blindness. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well. So if you've got a clever proof of something that you know isn't true, but you can make a (laughs) biblical case for it anyway, possibly using the Pythagorean theorem. It might be fun to share a few of those with others. It's a good reminder that a quick game of connect the dots does not make for sound exegesis. Send me some good ones. Thanks.